Stay on the road. Keep clear of the moors. Thank you. Beware the moon, lads. That's East Proctor. It's all about here at Moors. I go this way. Thanks for the ride, sir. <clears throat> Boys, keep off the moors. Stick to the roads. The best of luck. Okay, well, what do you say? We go in for a little food, huh? drink, rest? The slaughtered lamb. That's kind of strange. Did you hear that? I heard that. What was it? It's in front of us. Can you see anything? No. It sounds far away. Not far enough. Come on. Jack! What? Where are we going? I don't know. I'll tell you when we get there. Okay, because... <laughs> said they were attacked by an escaped lunatic. Well, it's a lunatic. Take your pardon. It's an animal. What? A wolf. You've never had bad dreams before? Well, sure, as a kid, but never so real. Never so weird. <laughs> Look, Dr. Hirsch, I know I was traumatized, but Jack was torn apart. I saw him. Nasty business with those two young American boys, wasn't it? A few weeks back. Last full moon, wasn't it? The escaped lunatic, the one who killed the boy. David! What? We were attacked by a werewolf. I'm not listening to this. On the moors, we were attacked by a lycanthrope. There's something wrong with this place. That much I understand. It's almost full moon. The supernatural. <laughs> the power of darkness. It's all true. My friend Jack was just here. Your dead friend, Jack. He told me that I will become a monster in two days. You've got to believe me, David. That tomorrow night, beneath the full moon, I'll sprout hair and fangs and eat people? I will not accept this. An American Werewolf in London hit US screens on the 21st of August 1981 and made its way to the UK in November of that year. Directed by John Landis who had made a name for himself with the comedy hits Animal House and The Blues Brothers, the film cost in the region of around $10 million and was very successful pulling in $62 million worldwide. It did face competition from two other werewolf related movies with The Howling and Wolfen but managed to beat both movies at the box office. The year of the film's release, an Oscar category for makeup was introduced for the first time, and Rick Baker won the award for his efforts on the movie. Rick and his team set a new benchmark for practical makeup effects, which have rarely been equaled with the large amount of werewolf movies over the years. With the film's mix of comedy and horror, some people weren't ready for it. Critics felt Landis was focusing on it being more of a comedy and less of a horror picture, and vice versa. The New York Times said the screenplay and direction by Landis was ham-fisted. Roger Ebert felt the film was unfinished, complaining about lack of character development and a weak ending. Critics also highlighted Landis spent too much time focusing on the makeup effects and less so on the story. Others praised its mix of comedy and horror, and this approach inspired filmmakers in the 80s, such as Sam Raimi, who became a master of mixing the two genres. Michael Jackson became a huge fan of the film, most especially the makeup and creature effects. He insisted on hiring John Landis to work on his new music video Thriller, which came out in 1983. When John Landis agreed to direct, which was his first music video, he brought on board the crew who helped him on the film, including cinematographer Robert Paintner, composer Elmer Bernstein, Landis' wife Deborah Nadulman to design the costumes, and of course Rick Baker to handle the makeup effects. The music video blew people away with its production values and its attempts to tell a short story. This approach changed the face of music videos from then on. Over the years, An American Werewolf in London has managed to maintain a strong fanbase. 
it was even one of Stanley Kubrick's favourite films, and the makeup effects have stood the test of time. Many regard it as John Landis' best movie of his career. The film did have a sequel in 1997, which was loosely connected to the original, which I'll discuss later. John Landis, when he was 18 years old, came up with the story while he was working in Yugoslavia as a production assistant on the film Kelly's Heroes in 1969. During the filming, he and a member of the crew were driving a car on location when they came across a group of gypsies. The gypsies appeared to be performing rituals and a man being buried feet first, so he would not return, rising from the grave. The crew member found it hysterical, but John Landis found it fascinating. He felt if the man came back from the dead, he would be totally unequipped to deal with it and accept the reality of it. The idea of someone returning from the grave would be ridiculous. This idea spurred him on to write his first draft. Landis wanted to make a monster movie. He settled on a werewolf after being a huge fan of the Universal classics. John did some research into werewolves and the highest number of real accusations of someone being a werewolf was in France and Wales. He didn't speak French so avoided filming there and at the time there were tax incentives to shoot in the UK so he decided to set the film in London. He wanted to make a contemporary version of the old horror movies. His script was a mix of comedy and horror and it managed to gain him work due to the strengths of the script but many read it feeling it was too funny or too scary. They got confused thinking is this a comedy and John would say no it's a horror but it's funny. Producers at the time couldn't wrap their heads around it and didn't want to commission it to be made, so the script sat dormant for over a decade. Two years later, after writing the script, Landis wrote, directed and starred in his debut film, Schlock, where he got to work with Rick Baker for the first time and had discussed with Rick his script for American Werewolf. John Landis wanted the transformation of the man into a wolf to be a painful experience and this to happen all in one take and not the old fashioned way of seeing dissolving transitions like the classic Wolfman film. Rick was really excited to see this movie made, but found it difficult to visualise how to achieve what John wanted, but started developing ideas and techniques to make this transformation possible. Through the 70s and the start of the 80s, Landis gained success as a comedy writer and director, with the hits The Kentucky Fried Movie, National Lampoon's Animal House and The Blues Brothers. He managed to finally secure funding for his werewolf script from Polygram Pictures, who put up nearly $10 million. John would return to his script to make a few changes. The cinema featured at the end was supposed to be playing cartoons, so the violence on screen would then cut to cartoon violence, but the cinemas in Piccadilly had changed over the years to porno theatres, so he updated the script to reflect on the times. To fill out the cast of characters, John Landis cast David Norton as David Kessler. He was then known as the star of the Dr Pepper commercials. David did have a few acting gigs before becoming the face of Dr Pepper, but after the film was released, he was let go from the popular drinks company due to the nude scenes featured in the film. Since making the film, David has mainly worked in TV and has had a steady career as an actor. Griffin Dunn, starring in his first feature, plays Jack Goodman. David's close friend and unfortunately the first victim in the movie, although he returns as the undead, as he is stuck in limbo and can't cross over to the afterlife until the curse is lifted. Jenny Agata plays as the nurse Alex Price. She looks after David in hospital and forms a relationship with him. Jenny was already a successful actress at the time, having started acting in the early 60s and had been in the big budget sci-fi classic Logan's Run. She popped up in Child's Play 2 and more recently in Captain America The Winter Soldier. One moment in the film she claims she has a tight budget while she and David are food shopping, but she is living in a wealthy part of London. Nurses don't live on streets like this. John Woodvine plays Dr Hirsch, who goes to investigate his patient David's theories on who attacked him on the moors. John was a big star of British TV and even recently starred in Netflix's The Crown series as the Archbishop of York. We have supporting roles from some very familiar faces. We have Frank Oz as Dr Collins from the American Embassy. Frank worked on The Muppets, was the voice of Yoda and directed Little Shop of Horrors and co-directed The Dark Crystal with Jim Henson. For the characters in The Slaughtered Lamb, we have David Schofield credited as the dance player. David went on to have a very successful career starring in Gladiator and the Pirates of the Caribbean films. Also the 2010 film The Wolfman and teamed up again with John Landis in Burke and Hare. The late Brian Glover plays the chess player. I'm sure many of you will recognise him from Alien 3 and one of the classic episodes of Bottom as Richie and Eddie deal with the gas man. And last but not least, we have an early performance from the late great Rick Mayle, the star of The Young Ones, Bottom, and for many Americans, the star of Drop Dead Fred. Filming took place between February and March of 1981. 
because director John Landis wanted the weather to be bad for atmosphere. He even got to make use of the relatively new Steadicam system for the dream sequences. The moors were filmed around the Black Mountains in Wales, and East Proctor is in reality the tiny village of Crickadarn. The Angel of Death statue was actually a prop added for the film. The exterior of the pub known as the Slaughtered Lamb was actually a cottage located in Crickadarn, and the interior scenes were filmed in the Black Swan in Surrey. An American Werewolf in London was the first film allowed to shoot in Piccadilly Circus in 15 years, for its final act as the wolf escapes from the porno theatre. Landis managed to gain permission by inviting 300 members of London's Metropolitan Police Service to a screening of his then newly released film, The Blues Brothers. The police were so impressed by his work that they granted the production a two-night filming permit between the hours of 1 and 4 a.m. This scene featured a cameo of stunt coordinator Vic Armstrong as the bus driver. At the time, Vic doubled as Christopher Reeve in Superman and Harrison Ford in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The movie received two test screenings and the reactions from the audience made Landis remove some scenes and further trims were made to please the ratings board to get an R rating, which he later regretted. One scene was seeing the undead Jack eating a piece of toast, which falls out of his torn throat. The sex scene between Alex and David was edited to be less explicit. An extended scene showing the homeless men along the Thames being attacked by the werewolf was also eliminated. Landis also concluded that the werewolf transformation scene should have been shorter. At the time, he was so fascinated by Rick Baker's effects that he spent more time on that scene than he otherwise would have. The film opens on the moors of Yorkshire as two Americans are backpacking across the county and dropped off by a local farmer. They are warned to stay off the moors and stick to the road. Reaching a local pub called The Slaughtered Lamb, they instantly get the impression they are not welcome. Jack inquires about a five-pointed star on the wall and the pub goers become hostile and the pair decide to leave. The landlady tries to stop them knowing what's prowling the moors. As they leave, they are again warned to stick to the road and to be aware of the full moon. David and Jack leave and end up wandering off the road onto the moors, where they begin to hear sinister howls, which seem to be getting closer. Meanwhile, the crowd in the pub argue over letting the boys go, but they ultimately refuse to go after them. The pair decide to head back to the pub, but realise that they are now lost, so they pick up the pace but are suddenly attacked by a large wolf-like animal. Jack is killed and the villagers save David just in time. David sees the corpse of a naked man lying next to him, not a large animal. David wakes up three weeks later and finds himself in hospital. He was informed that an escaped lunatic attacked him and Jack was killed. David insists they were actually attacked by a large wolf. During David's stay at the hospital, he is visited by his dead friend Jack, who explains they were attacked by a werewolf and that David will eventually become one. Jack argues David to kill himself before the next full moon, not only because Jack is cursed to be a ghost for as long as the bloodline of the wolf is unbroken, but also to prevent David from inflicting the same fate on anyone else. David does not believe him, thinking that Jack is a hallucination. Meanwhile, Dr. Hirsch goes to investigate David's story and visits the slaughtered lamb. When asked about the incident, the pub goers deny any knowledge of what happened. However, one speaks to Dr. Hirsch outside the pub and says David should not have been taken away and that everyone else will be in danger when he changes with the next full moon. Upon his release from intensive care, David moves in with Alex who has grown infatuated with him in the hospital. Shortly while staying there, he is visited again by Jack in a more advanced stage of decay, warning him that he will turn into a werewolf the next day. Jack again advises David to take his own life to avoid killing innocent people, but David still does not believe him and urges him to go away. David starts to become more paranoid the following day, and as he tries to kill time as the night draws in, the moon rises and he begins to burn up and tears his clothes off for his transformation. John Landis always intended Rick Baker to handle the makeup work on the movie, since showing him the script during the making of Schlock. When Landis got the funding in place, he phoned Baker to let him know the movie was happening, but Rick had started work on the Howling using the Changeo heads, which were originally intended for American Werewolf. The design was essentially seeing these wolf-like features extend out and change the human skull. Landis wasn't pleased at all, so Baker decided to part with the Howling production to work with Landis. Baker's colleague, Rob Bottin, who became a tour de force in makeup effects, took over and continued the makeup duties on the Howling. Before agreeing to jump on the film, Rick said he needed six months to work on the effects, so Landis cast Norton and Griffin very early on, so Rick could make moulds of their bodies. Rick Baker and John Landis had several disagreements on what the design of the werewolf should be. Baker wanted the werewolf to stand on its hind legs. 
Films such as The Wolfman and The Howling follow this design, but Landis wanted a four-legged hound from hell. The design of the wolf in my eyes is still the most frightening put to film. You don't look at it thinking there's an ounce of good behind its eyes. You can't tame it. This wolf is just out to kill. The big transformation sequence lasts over two minutes. John Landis wanted it to be a painful experience for David and as real as possible with no cutaways for the audience. It was heavily storyboarded and took six days to shoot, with only three shots done per day making the process time consuming for the crew, as they had to wait for the makeup team to get the makeup effects prepared for the next take. The set itself was raised so the puppeteers could get underneath to operate the transformation. The sequence would only be completed during the last week of filming. The elaborative animatronics consist of a fiberglass shell, foam and wolf hair. There were several animatronic heads made for the facial changes of the shot. The sections of the cheeks and forehead moved by pushing air through syringes. Norton sat through six 10-hour days in prosthetics for the transformation alone. Landis really made life hard for Baker by insisting that the sequence be shot in brightly lit flat lighting. Norton said that while most people assume the werewolf makeup was the most painful, even though it was the most time consuming for him, the worst was actually the dream sequence of him in a bed in the forest. The glass contact lenses were very painful to wear. As the wolf tears its way through Piccadilly, they get very creative in hiding its full body, with Rick Baker operating just ahead of the wolf as it bites and attacks its victims. I love the shot of the wolf in the underground. You see it in the distance as the camera looks down and it slowly approaches the guy on the escalator. It's brief, but very effective. There have been so many articles and discussions on the makeup effects, praising them over the years and for good reason. 37 years later, they still look incredible. No CGI trickery, just classic in-camera effects done by extremely talented individuals with a passion for filmmaking and their craft. The fine level of detail on Jack when he first appears in the hospital is extremely gruesome, and I often question how they got away with it at the time with the censors. My favourite moments of David changing is seeing his hand and legs extend and his spine change as you see it push through his back. It just looks so real. The early 80s seemed to be this sweet spot of truly impressive creature and makeup effects, with this and the thing being the most fondly remembered and are rarely equal today, even with the advances in technology. The film's score was handled by the veteran composer Elmer Bernstein, who had worked with John Landis on his previous two movies. Elmer doesn't provide music for the entire film, and it only appears in a few select sequences. I believe in total roughly only 10 minutes of music was composed. His score can be heard during David's Nightmare, when Jack visits David in hospital and Alex's flat, when Dr. Hirsch drives through the moors to East Proctor, and finally when Alex confronts David in the alley. Though Bernstein did write and perform music for the transformation scene, Landis had no intention to use it, as he had made his mind up on using Blue Moon. Most of the film's sound mix is taken up with existing pop songs, which refer to the moon such as Bobby Vinton's Blue Moon, Van Morrison's Moon Dance, and Credence Clearwater's revival's Bad Moon Rising. John Landis had wanted to use Elvis Presley's rendition of Blue Moon on the soundtrack, but Elvis's manager Tom Parker refused to license out any of his music and refused to budge even with Landis, so we decided to use the Marcel's version of the song instead. The songs that are used are iconic and fit well with the film. When I hear those songs on the radio now, I often think of the film, but personally I was more interested in hearing Elmer Bernstein's score. There were scenes that could have benefited with more orchestral music. Some of the pop songs sound dated now, especially during the love scene, so a more original scoring would have made the sound more timeless. Even though I say there should be more original music, there are moments where traditionally you would have a score, but Landis made the right move creatively to just have the sound effects. The chase sequence in the underground, for example, works brilliantly without any music, and just hearing the wolf growling is pretty terrifying. With the limited amount of music composed for the film, there was never a soundtrack release. Who's going to buy 10 minutes of music? Maybe a hardcore collector, but the general public? No way. The transformation piece that wasn't used in the film did manage to find its way to a compilation album, I believe, but nothing in an official capacity has come out, sadly, of Elmer's work. There was an LP release at the time called Impressions of an American Werewolf in London, with covers of the songs featured in the film. This is not worth seeking out if you're a fan, so don't be fooled if you find it out in the wild in a second-hand shop or comic convention. As mentioned at the start of the video, there was a sequel in 1997 called An American Werewolf in Paris, distributed by Disney's Hollywood Pictures. Directed by Anthony Waller and made with a budget of $22 million, it bombed at the box office, only bringing in $26 million in the USA. 
the film featured a completely different cast and crew and is only loosely connected to the original. The daughter of Alex Price is living in Paris and trying to overcome her lycanthropic disease with the help of her stepfather. A bunch of American tourists are on a trip around Europe and manage to stop her from plunging to her death from the top of the Eiffel Tower. Andy, played by Tom Everett Scott, falls in love with her, not knowing she is a werewolf and eventually becomes one too. The film deals with a secret society of werewolves based in the city and a drug which allows werewolves to change at any time, so the requirement for a full moon is no longer needed. This doesn't make use of any practical makeup effects and relies heavily on CGI. The mid to late 90s had so many films taking advantage of this technology as it became more affordable and many didn't think if it was the best approach as you can see the FX have dated quite badly and they were criticised even at the time. I remember renting this film when it came out and I recall quite liking it. Upon revisiting it, I don't know what I was thinking. It's not scary, it's got loads of stupid humour bordering on the camp side of things and the tone is radically different to the Landis original. I don't know what they were thinking with this one, it was a huge misfire. It's a stupid teen comedy with lousy attempts at horror thrown in. There has been talk of a remake for a while and only recently John's son Max who has had a successful career as a writer has completed his script for the remake which apparently has the story running alongside the events of the original though I'm not sure if this is 100% confirmed. Max is listed as the director as well. I'm certainly not against the idea of a new film because it's been nearly 40 years since the original as long as the story offers something new and doesn't just follow a similar path and hopefully expands on the mythology of the wolf and its curse, then I'll certainly give it a go and watch it when it comes out. An American Werewolf in London was one of those 80s horrors I grew up watching that I really struggled to watch without getting scared stiff. As a kid having a TV in your bedroom, you would catch the beginning when it was on Channel 4 late at night, and it tricks you into a false sense of security. You have these great familiar British actors in The Slaughtered Lamb throwing out jokes, so you start feeling comfortable, but things take a turn for the worst quickly. Once they become hostile it amps up the tension and once the wolf starts howling in the moors I found myself watching it through my hands and would often change the channel before things got too scary. When I manned up a bit as I got older I revisited the movie and was really impressed with its style with its mix of comedy and horror and it hasn't at all lost its bite. The story is straightforward and simple and if you are familiar with other werewolf movies of the past and the folklore of the curse, the film plays with those themes and ideas and presents them in a modern fashion. I never had the chance to see the old Wolfman movie from Universal. I don't think it was shown that often when I was a kid and I would have probably complained that it was in black and white and changed the channel. I remember watching the Wolves of Willoughby Chase and being spooked out by that. But American Werewolf in London was the one that showed you the true display of what they could do. It uses the often cliched tropes but plays with them in a different way so you don't feel everything is all too familiar. The scenario of two strangers walking into a pub and everything goes quiet always happens in the movies. The two Americans feel totally out of place but things settle down and the locals accept these new guests but once they get too nosy they are forced out. You see those two polar opposites of thinking with the folk in the village being old fashioned and believing in curses and the dark arts and the people in London who are cynical and follow the rules of science and logic. It feels like the clashing of two different time periods. As the Americans visit the old town it feels like they have stepped into the past and then waking up in a modernised London but London is ultimately the victim. Landis's original idea about experiencing the undead and coming to terms with the reality spurred on the story and is executed in a realistic fashion. David is coming to terms with what happens after death and the myth surrounding werewolves and he reacts how most people would. He doesn't believe it and thinks it's all bullshit. Even his doctor tries to come up with a logical excuse to the villagers beliefs that David will become a werewolf. The scenes with the doctor and the police feel like they are ripped straight out of a TV detective drama but has excellent slices of comedy, with the Doctor getting hassled by his receptionist. Yes? Roger Matheson, Doctor. Oh, not here. He's on the telephone. Well, tell him I'm out. Tell him I've passed away. Uh, an old wall. Everyone in the film provides a great performance. The chemistry between David and Griffin is spot on, as you totally believe they are best friends and their banter seems like a real conversation. Jenny as the super posh nurse Alex, who comes to comfort David, tries her best to help him, but like the doctor, she tries to think logically about it and doesn't understand his warnings to stay away from her, knowing what he has done. Making use of a wide variety of British actors who play their roles so straight, despite the sprinkles of humour throughout, really helps sell its believability. 
No one acts over the top so it doesn't border into a parody of the genre. The setting with the countryside and the miserable English weather with a combination of the cast just remind me of the old Hammer horrors for some reason. The photography by Bob Paintner is superb, lovely earthy colours capturing the English countryside. And even during the nighttime scenes, everything is clear to the viewer capturing that traditional cinematic style London is often represented on film. Even though it's a comedy and horror, it's also a sweet love story. It's simple with its execution even if they fall in love pretty quickly, but love at first sight is pretty common in Hollywood films to speed up the story. David tells her that he loves her but warns her to stay away, and leaves giving her no time to express her feelings in return. Once David has transformed and attacked the people in Piccadilly Circus and is cornered by the police, Alex gets her chance to express her love for him. This moment is heartbreaking thanks to Jenny's performance, which seems genuine. You can interpret the ending in two ways. When she says she loves him, we see a close-up of the wolf as its eyes focus. One way you could see it is making you believe David is still there, and attacks knowing he will be shot to end his own life. Or that David is totally gone when he has transformed and the wolf sees her as food and attacks. Maybe I'm overthinking this moment, but it's not completely clean cut. Some critics complain that it has a weak ending. Just seeing David lying there dead is probably the best way. I don't think the audience needed any more story to finalise it. It would have just been extra baggage. I find it strange looking back at the old reviews where they focused heavily on the makeup and highlighted its story as a problem. I feel we get to know the characters and the narrative is clear, and it doesn't feel baggy with its story. It's tight and concise with its three act structure, and with a suitable runtime for a horror flick. It would have been interesting to have additional scenes with the Doctor going through libraries to find old records on the curse, or getting more information from the villagers about how long the werewolf has been roaming the moors, but it's often best to avoid explaining too much and leaving it up to your imagination to fill in any gaps as the film does give enough information to make the events plausible, and to get you invested in David's plight and his eventual transformation into the beast. When I look back at horror movies, especially during the 80s, there are only a select few that still hit the spot when it comes to scaring me, and American Werewolf in London is one of them. The opening sequence on the moors as the wolf is getting closer to them is really tense, and if you have surround sound, hearing the werewolf from the rear channels really helps elevate the scares, and the chase on the underground works a treat. If you grew up on many of the classic horrors from the 80s, they would often scare you as a kid, rightly so, but revisiting them as an adult, they rarely have the same effect. But it often doesn't matter as the story, design and makeup effects keep you engaged. An American Werewolf in London is still effective after all these years, and set new standards for makeup and creature effects, and showed us that John Landis was more than just a comedy writer and director. Has David persisted in his werewolf fantasies? Dr. Hirsch, what's wrong? Is this more serious than I know? David's lacerations were cleaned and dressed before he arrived here. Yet supposedly, no other doctor examined him before I did. The Goodman boy's in the ground already. He's no use to us. So, I went to the pub in East Proctor today, where I was convinced of two things. They were lying. There were no witnesses, no escaped lunatic. The whole community is hiding the truth of what actually happened up there. If all the villagers believe that Jack Goodman was killed by a werewolf, why shouldn't David? And then it follows that if he survived an attack by a werewolf, wouldn't he himself become a werewolf at the next full moon? Oh, I don't mean running about on all fours and howling at the moon. But in such a deranged state, he might harm himself, or perhaps other people. David! David, stop! I'm going to the police! Jack was right! Jack is dead! Oh, Jack is dead and six people are dead. There's gonna be a full moon tonight. I'm going to the cops. I gotta do so. I gotta get out of here. David, don't lose control. Oh, control? What control? Jack was real. He tried to warn me and I thought I was crazy. David. I love you. What? I love you. I. But I think I did some terrible things last night, things I can't remember. David, let's go and see Dr. Hirsch. No, you got to stay away from me, Oscar. David, I can help you. No, I'm not safe to be with. you got to stay away from me. I love you, Alex. David. They're going to kill you. Please let me help you. 